Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 245 of the Canadian Football Countdown, a proud member of the Canadian Football Podcast Network and the Alternative Football Network. Uh, Ryan and Trey here with you this evening. We're back second week in a row. We're back at it. Uh, I think you can officially call it a streak now that we got two weeks in a row without something derailing the podcast. So uh, we're back. Uh, and we're here with another edition of the uh, the off-season series we call The Countdown. And we're talking top five CFL running backs for 2024 today. We've made our lists. Adam, unfortunately, had something come up tonight, so he couldn't be here. But he did send his in as well, so we'll go over that. Uh, we got some other fun topics uh, and some not-so-fun ones uh, to talk about in between. Uh, and we'll take your comments and questions in the live chat because we are live thanks to presenting sponsor GameTime TV. Learn more at GameTimeTV.ca or Facebook.com slash GameTimeTVMB. Trey, how are you doing today? I can't complain, man. You know, nice weather outside. We've got some football to talk about. Jays haven't completely disappointed me yet this year. Uh, I mean, they're three and four now, I guess, but they were five hundred today. And uh, I, are the Jets still in the playoff contention? So, I mean, I, whatever. Hey, they won. They broke the losing streaks. So. Oh, did they? I, so I just saw the Raptors haven't won a game since March third. So they wow, uh, that's they're a playing, whole month. Yeah, they're playing for next year. It looks like so. All right. <laughs> Are the rap the Raptors were good. Like a they won the championship like a couple then, yeah, years after, ago. Right? After Kawhi because Kawhi left, it went downhill. They they had a couple of years where they were decent, but now they've lost a bunch of their best players, so they're rebuilding. But basketball basketball is one of those weird ones where you could buy a team in an off season kind of easier. So I like the CFL, which I guess we'll talk about. Yeah, for sure. Uh, before we get into our regular topics here, uh, we do want to acknowledge that the Canadian Football Countdown is brought to you from Treaty 1 Territory, traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oja Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples in the homeland of the Métis Nation, as well as from Treaty 4 Territory, traditional territory of the Cree, Soto, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and Métis Nation. If you want additional content or additional opportunities uh, to chat with us, uh, in between episodes, uh, there is a link in the episode description to the Canadian Football Countdown Discord community. It's free to join if you have a Discord account, uh, which is free to sign up for as well. Uh, and we chat CFL, NFL, UFL, uh, Blue Jays, and MLB chat has been going on in there a little bit as well. Anything and everything in between. Come uh, come join the community and chat along with us throughout the off season and uh, throughout the season there as well. Uh, we've got kids watching tonight, Trey, uh, according to the comments here. So, uh, best behavior. I, I'll, I'll try to rein it in, uh, tonight. Hey, you're, the, you're the, you're the animal on this show, man. We all know that. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll try to, I'll try to rein it in here a little bit, uh, for myself, but, uh, no promises. Um, yeah, should be a fun show tonight. We'll get to the top five countdown later on, but uh, let's start off with some uh, other topics CFL related. Chase Claypool uh, is uh, on the Riders negotiation list uh, as of this week. Uh, of course, this is NFL wide receiver, Canadian born Chase Claypool. Uh, started out with the Pittsburgh Steelers, uh, correct? Uh, ended up getting traded to Chicago, uh, I believe, or let go and went to Chicago. Then was he with Miami last? I feel like he got They picked him up. They picked him up late because I thought um, McDaniels had some hope in him. Right. And uh, so uh, N- Notre Dame alum, thank you, XFL Mike G in the chat as well. Uh, so, you you know, Chase Claypool, a rumor from an NFL based account came out this week that, uh, what was it? He was considering, was it the BC Lions and the Saskatchewan Rough Riders? I, I found like that. Yeah. I think, uh, were the ones potentially being discussed and, uh, that supposedly making competitive offers for, uh, Claypool. Which yeah. then Farhan Lalji completely shut down and said that neither of the team have even contacted him or made an offer. Uh, and then suddenly, two days later, the Riders now added him to the uh, uh, negotiation list. So, I don't know. Like, it's the negotiation list. 
I mean, we've seen guys go on that list before. Like, uh, I think it was the Alouettes or the Lions, but Colin Kaepernick on the list. Yeah. Like, sometimes you get these big names going on there and the off chance they come to the NFL, to the C- from the NFL to the CFL, you technically get their rights uh, and first shot to sign them if that happens. But more often than not, it's not realistically going to be the case. What do you think, though, for Claypool? I mean, his NFL career seems like it's going downhill a little bit. Do you think there's a shot he comes to the green and white? I mean, I kind of hope so, because from his track record, he sounds like he would just completely destroy that locker room. And uh, and I think Adam would would love that. I I, I have said for a while that I think that he would – he might translate a little bit better into the Canadian game. And he is one of those players where uh, I don't think, I don't think, um, Pitt, I don't think it was Pittsburgh's fault by any means, but I think he's the problem a little bit, but he definitely has the talent. It's one of those ones where ego got in, in front of the talent a little bit. He hasn't been, he acts like a top five receiver and he's never been one, but I think in Canada, if he, okay, it's the same thing as Menzel. If Menzel actually tried, he probably could have succeeded in this league. I th- I think. I don't think he tried. Same with Ocho Cinco. If he tried, he could have actually maybe did okay in this league. And if Colin Ka- Kaepernick wanted to come up and try, I think he would probably, yes, lead the league in passing yards easily. Even, maybe not now, but if he did whenever, four, three, four years ago when he was in there. And, yeah, if Chase Claypool comes up, I think he'd be competitive. I think he would help the Rough Riders if he cleaned up his ego or whatever whatever is whatever is plaguing a guy who's what under 26 and then he's been on three teams or whatever he is so yeah and more often than not these nfl uh, stunt i almost want to say stunt casting right Right. of uh, oh this guy is a big name bring him in uh, he's gonna light up the cfl doesn't happen because they, they they come in with that attitude that they're just going to light up the cfl that this is a lesser league they can come in and play in and it's an entirely different game, you know, different rule set, different field size, different movements and packages yeah. and things like that, number of guys on the field. Yeah. Uh, so it's it, it's it doesn't translate necessarily. But I, I agree there's talent there. I mean, he showed it 2020, yeah. at, uh, 2020 and 2021 with Pittsburgh, uh, you know, over 850 yards in both of those seasons for him there uh, and, and nine touchdowns in that 2020 season. Just looking at his stats here. Uh, but it's kind of trailed off his usage since then. And like you said, bouncing around between teams. I don't think he's going to come to the CFL. It would be fun to see what happens if he does, but I'm going to I'm gonna guess that uh, it's not going to happen. And I, I don't think Saskatchewan needs him, right? Like they, if we're talking Canadian talent at wide receiver, they've got Keon Schaefer-Baker, they've got Braden Lenius, they've got Mitchell Pickton. I, I would put the Riders up there with almost any other team in terms of uh, Canadian wide receiver talent in the CFL. So, see, I wonder if this come, came from an NFL news space, though. That's kind of we like I could see a Canadian one doing this for clicks, but it's kind of funny that it came from an NFL kind of source. So, I wonder maybe maybe the Rough Riders were in the process of putting them on the negotiation list or something, and that got mixed up in translation. Where to an NFL, that's a kind of a weird concept, right? Where they're like, oh, there's some signing going on, right? So unless there's that, but no, I, it would be cool and for the three weeks of watching Adam tear out when he like, will get two catches for five yards and maybe $200,000 of a salary cap or something hit. You know, that I think that would be fun, but other than that, okay. Yeah, I, I'll be shocked if it happens, but if it, if it does, then sweet. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see what happens from there. I guess. Uh, and uh, best of luck to him if he does decide to give it a shot. I think he'll bounce around and look for more NFL opportunities, though. Yeah. Right? Like, like you that talent. The talent doesn't just drop off. I feel like that drastically. That he wouldn't be a depth receiver option for a team. Uh, to I mean, in. yeah. If a team's willing to sign Deshaun Watson. You know what I mean? And other guys with problems like they're gonna be honest, though. If they're willing to sign guys like that, Toronto hasn't cut Kelly yet. There's you know, people there's a lot of things. So, you know, if there's an yeah. ego's all that the problem is, I'm sure there's teams that can sort it out. I actually maybe even thought before he left, Belichick in New England 
I thought maybe, you know, Bel- Belichick wouldn't take that at the beginning, but if there's maybe one guy who would get rid of that, I thought maybe it'd be him. Um, yeah, but I don't know. Oh, and, and let's be clear when you're comparing some of those guys there, like Deshaun Watson yeah, I know. and what he's done versus. That's, that's, that's my point. What they've done is probably worse, you know. And, and teams they, are still giving them a chance. They're giving yeah. them shots. And, and But it seems to be Claypool's problem is just some level of ego or. Ethic, level, ethic, ethic or ethic, work ethic or something like that, and and those are you know you which I don't understand. Like unless it's just that thing, like, you know. I wonder too. I don't know where he's from. Somewhere in Ontario, probably. Uh, according to Richard in the YouTube chat uh, from Abbotsford, Abbotsford, BC. Okay, good point. But still, he probably somewhat small town. Then he next thing you know, he goes to Notre Dame, where he probably was big man on campus to some degree. He's the starting receiver on Notre Dame and, and, you know, things like that go to people's heads. And now he's in the NFL. I was the, you know, high draft pick for Pittsburgh and this sort of, wasn't he the highest Canadian ever? Something like that. Yeah. Something like that, you know, and all that stuff. And, and, you know, but I would hope that you said one thing about guys who come up here thinking it would be a breeze. I'd hope that he would have some respect for it up here but you know you never know you never know uh well from potential bidders and the the riders i guess winning the bidding race potentially for chase claypool to potential bidders for another thing and that's the edmonton elks football team uh that they're looking for private ownership for the team and uh reports came out this week uh supposedly 20 different uh suitors uh, or people, organizations, uh, groups potentially uh, sign non-disclosure agreements, uh, and they, I'm assuming that means put bids in to own the Edmonton Elks. So it's us up against 19 others. Uh, oh, what do you, what do you think? Trey? You think we got a shot? You just broke contract. <laughs> oh, like, that, that's uh, that's millions out of our pocket right now. Um, oh, yeah, there I think goes that. that. <laughs> oh man, that goes there goes our great cup plans and you know and everything, man. But uh I think it's good. I mean that's that's that seems to be way more than Montreal. I know Montreal had a few when they were going through it and and even um where am I blocking here? But yeah, no, and, and there's been a couple people sniffing around Quebec City and Atlantic Canada for expansion. So yeah, it's good to see 20 interested parties. You know, and I wonder how many interested parties haven't gotten that far yet still too, or, you know, maybe even cut off. Maybe they just only accepted 20 of the top ones, you know. So it's good to see. I think some ownership change in that in that franchise is well needed. And uh, hopefully one of those 19 others will go and do an expansion team somewhere. So. Yeah, I, I think it's really good as well, especially, you know, things are, things are bleak for Edmonton right now, attendance-wise. I mean – the long losing streak uh, that the Elks had. They won a home game this year, right? I think they finally broke that streak. Yeah. Pretty sure they did. Yeah. Um, You know, they finally did. uh, But a lot of people walked away and said the the experience at the stadium wasn't great. And then the losing streak and just things were down for Edmonton. And and this is a city that we're not used to seeing those things because isn't Edmonton the city of champions, right? And they were good for a very long time. Uh, And and so I think they need somebody who's to come in, be excited still about the team. And it's great to see 20 different groups uh, be excited uh, to still want to take that on uh, and try to turn things around. Uh, and, and hopefully they have a similar effect to what Amar Doman's done as the owner out in BC, right? He, he took over in 2021 and now in BC, you know, this was a place that was struggling attendance wise for many years. And what has been the talk of this, the league the last couple of years is just business booming for the lions and the stadium being packed and the upper bowl being opened there and the concert series they've always got going on in game day events. The lions have turned around a great game day experience uh that made people excited to go and watch them play it helps to have them winning uh, as much as they have been and that goes a long way uh but hopefully whoever steps in to own the uh, the elks can kind of have a similar effect my favorite rumor that i have seen is uh what if victor cooey is uh one of the 20 potential parties after he was let go by the team and uh comes around and buys them for private ownership he's probably got the money for it honestly yeah, I wonder what kind of 
money CFL teams go for? Because I thought I heard the Washington Football Club, and I know there's two different leagues, but they were looking at two and a half billion or something like that. So I wonder what a CFL team is in comparison. Yeah, that's a good question. Because it, you know, a little bit closer, NF, NHL expansions a billion. I think the Jets were like the Thrashers were purchased for half of half of that, if not a little less. So, yeah, I'm, I'm curious. So, I mean, if you didn't blow our opportunities, Ryan, we might have had a chance at that. You know, to oh, shoot. You, get you have to remember, Adam's got that farmer money, man. He always, you know, <laughs> you got to sell one of those tractors, and that might be enough. So I searched, I googled right now what uh, what Edmonton Elks worth. Uh, and the first thing that came up was a Reddit thread from our, uh, the Edmonton subreddit, not, not the football, the CFL subreddit, the Edmonton subreddit. Uh, and the two top voted comments are eight Scrabble points and less than a moose, more than a deer. So, uh, yeah, that didn't really provide much, uh, helpful info. See, there. That, that is the most CFL thing <laughs> in the league where we can't find out salaries and, and stuff like that. So why would we know how much a franchise costs? Yeah, if anybody knows, let it'll also know. be tough because they're coming from community owned too, right? So I wonder, you know, that's kind of tough to. There might be a lot, little bit of red tape and different things to go through, right? It's not as simple as just one person to another. I wonder, right? So, yeah, so we'll see. Uh, we'll see who takes over the Edmonton Elks uh, football club, uh, or the Edmonton football club, also known as the Edmonton Elks. We, 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 we've, we've we've agreed before, right? That the name's got nothing to do with it, right? Because I keep what seeing, do you mean? but I keep seeing people still complain about the name. No, those people need to grow up. Yeah, that's what, and I and I wonder because I see that about Washington and Cleveland too, and I, I just wonder uh, how much of it's actually like again, it's tough to tell on Twitter and stuff like that how much is real and how much of it like are are the thousand people or not a thousand but are the hundred people complaining are those the only a hundred? Or is there hundreds more that aren't complaining? You never can really tell, right? So, and I don't know, like, I think it's just, you know, I agree with you, grow up and get over it. But I just see so many people say they've stopped buying the tickets since the name changed. And I just wonder if that's actually real. I, I just don't, yeah. I, I believe that there are people that have done this that are, yeah. have turned away their, turned in their fan card because the name changed. I don't believe these people have a good reason for doing so. Yeah. Though. And I question the fan status to begin with. If the if the name of the team changing away from something that is considered offensive uh, to some parties uh, really uh, makes you not want to go watch the product on the field, then then yeah, I, I question how much of a fan you are to begin with. No, I, I wholeheartedly agree. But like I said, from a business standpoint, if we drop ethics and morality for a second, from a business standpoint. I mean, because there's none of that in business, right? I, yeah, that's what I mean. Like, because I I see things once in a while saying that people are suing Washington to get the old name back, and I I just wonder how much again is that true? And apparently there was enough of a, the community that enjoyed the name or something, and so I want like you know you're never going to please everybody, so that's why I just wonder how much of a financial hit are people actually going to take from trying to be politically correct you know disney's taking a hit from being politically correct and it's probably the right thing but right so anyway, yeah you know but we could talk about that yeah i i agree with you that uh it's an interesting thing to consider is how much does that impact sales uh out of it uh, i would i hope not much but uh i i, I agree with you that it, it probably does have some impact uh, as stupid as that is uh moving on to our next topic here uh, a bit of a sad one uh riders legend passing away today uh jim hobson uh trey and i admittedly both don't know much about him uh ourselves but our resident riders expert uh adam uh did fill us in kind of uh, uh on the gravity i guess of uh of this loss uh he was the riders president from 2005 to 2014 led them to two great cups was the main reason uh the riders got a new stadium uh all around nicest guy in saskatchewan uh for the last 20 years running uh according to adam and uh it took the riders from being a lovable joke to the marquee franchise during that time period which they were i mean they were one of the cream of crop and cfl yeah um 
born and raised in Regina. Uh, and Adam said he put him on the Mount Rushmore of riders. Uh, so a uh, huge loss and uh, our condolences to the Hobson family and uh, Rider Nation and really everyone. I, I it feels like we've lost a lot of CFL legends this year, hasn't it? Like the Bombers, I feel like uh, recently there were a couple that passed away. Yeah. I mean, yeah, getting to that, you know, we're getting, I mean, I th- I, f- I wonder if it's that or I wonder if maybe we're just at a at an all time where we know, because, you know, how many times there's there past players that maybe we don't even know about, you know, kind of thing anymore. We don't know what's going on with them as much, but now we're in an all time era of, Twitter and Facebook and and things like that, but yeah, it does seem like that. And you know, it's sad, but it's uh, it's uh, life. Well, it's the circle of life, right? Yeah. And but yeah, you know, condolences to the Rough Riders. You know, we make we make jokes about the Rough Riders as Bomber fans, but in the long grand scheme of things, you know, we're as close as heck cousins as we can get, <laughs> right? With the Rough Riders, and yeah, so their loss is our loss. Yeah, for sure. Well said on that one. Uh... Yeah, Richard. and Richard says yeah. so. You're saying we're getting old. You know that's part of it too. Like I, I'm a diehard CFL fan, but I know no CFL history, like pre 2000s yeah. or anything like that. Like I, uh, I, I started tuning in the CFL when I say like mid the 2000s, like 2005, 2006 was when I really started tuning into it. I, I haven't watched old stuff so oftentimes when we're talking about these legends or when legends pass away and i mean when hobson was more involved obviously in more recent years uh at the management level there but uh talking about some of these other guys you know when we're talking about the legends of the game passing away or just uh, historical legends i don't know anything about them yeah. besides what i see on social media so you know, now we're going to, as time goes along and then as we do get older, you know, we're going to uh, more and more so start seeing news like this and feeling the impact because these are guys we watched, right? Yeah, but yes, Richard, we're getting old. I'm finding gray hairs in my beard every day. It's, yeah. Yeah, the hairs keep getting grayer for sure. Oh, man. And ginger hair goes like white. <laughs> <laughs> like there, there's no salt and pepper and ginger hair, man. It just goes white. So, yeah. Well, uh, uh, a man who, uh, speaking of getting older, <laughs> this, is, this is a great segue oh, into yeah, the yeah. next topic. I'm, uh, I'm on a roll with these tonight. I feel like uh, the ageless wonder himself, potentially. Uh, no, I, I think he is the ageless wonder. He posted this on X on April Fool's Day, but did include the hashtag no April Fools. The great Milt Stiegel uh, tweeting out, my plan is to report to someone's training camp this May and go through one day of practice. I love it. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm sure the Bombers would allow him to come in, you know, Um and do one day of practice, but like I, I'm sure that concept is easy. But oh man, he's <laughs> what 54? We said, yeah, yeah, 50 Milt's 54, like what that. He, and he started his NFL career like the year around you were born, yeah. Like I, I thought <laughs> when we were talking about it, like I, I mean, I, the more I do the math, think about how long his career was, and you know, when he started his career and stuff, like it makes sense. But I don't know. When I think of Milt, I still think of him as a, as I don't know, early forties uh, for Stiegel. I mean, he, I thought when did he retired pretty late too into his career? I thought too, right? Like it, yeah, he, but he, it, but that just shows, I guess how, uh, how, how, uh, how on top of his game, he still was near the end where we didn't even realize that he was what mid late thirties when he retired. Something like that, because he must have retired about 15, 16 years ago now. Uh, he retired 2009, so yeah, 15, yeah, 15 years ago. 15 years ago. Wow. So that's when he, he, yeah, he retired at 39. So, and he had, I mean, he looks like he's in shape. I'm sure he could still run some routes. I'm sure he could catch some balls. I don't think a 54-year-old can take a hit. Uh, so I would stick to padless practice. To, uh, <laughs> That's, well, they do that for the most part. Yeah, so. I would stick to that. I I would not want to actually see him on the field. Um, you know, at fifty four, I even think like uh, you know a good game of touch football might be a little, 
little tough, but he looks good for 54. I'll give him that. Uh, he might be the most fit 54 year old I've seen. Uh, Milt Steele. Yeah. I, th- I think he could still do it. The, yeah, taking the hit. I think that's the problem. But I don't know. Is he fast enough still that he can just avoid taking that hit? I mean, he, 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 he avoided them in his prime a lot, I felt like. I think that's what helped him with his long career is he was just always – I was always fl- I was always amazed by him as a kid because that we were talking about you know when we started watching football. I mean, Steagle was our childhoods, right? Yeah, like, or, yes. you know, so it was the uh, that and the big ninety five yard play at, against Edmonton, right, or whatever that is, and it was the crazy plays and and stuff like that. But ah, oh, man, to play still, I yeah, like I said, opening day of training camp, I could see him going down to IG Field, and they're not gonna not like not let him in. <laughs> right, like he's his name is up on the Ring of Honor. I think he's gonna get let in, and I think they'll let him catch a ball or two. I just think, like I, I, I want him to go. Yeah, spend training camp with a team and have TSN follow him around with cameras, do a documentary or something. Oh, like hard that. knocks, like, but with Steagle. Yeah, like as the league's official broadcast partner, like TSN does the bare minimum. Right, like, and because there's no competition, but you know, the, okay, they have CFL Wired where they have like the the mics on, and they'll replay that on TSN two like 25 <laughs> times a week. But like, give me more random content like this from TSN. Like, I want to see Stiegel mic'd up at training camp. Uh, uh you know, uh, send Dunnigan out to somewhere else for training camp. I mean, it might be tough, but almost do like what uh, was it? Eli Manning. They put that mask on him or something and send him to a college. And he went as a he he did a walk on and uh, or whatever. And he he was the best player out there. But they cut him because he was like, oh, you're past your age eligibility because he was like already a retired NFLer. <laughs> so I was like, so I guess we could do that. But uh, yeah, I don't. Know. I think I I wholeheartedly think Stiegel believes he can do it. I think he thinks. <laughs> I wholeheartedly know that for a fact that he would put his whole life savings on that. But oh yeah, yeah, and yeah, I agree with the yeah. Or it would be better like a hidden camera on him, like where nobody knows it, and he's just sitting there. And I just feel like he would uh, trash. I, I bet his trash talk is still prime. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, you see him in uh, Davis Sanchez on the panel. Yeah, I would pay to see that. San- Sanchez is as a DB. Put them out there. One-on-one practice. I'll yeah, that would be sweet. Well, I, I feel that. like they did that once. Or there was a big thing where Stiegel caught a pass at IG Field, like, pregame. They did that for the home opener at IG. I thought Dunnigan threw him one. Oh, for yeah, the, yeah, For yeah. the very first game at uh, IG Field or Princess Auto. We, uh, we got a lot of uh, live chat comments coming yeah. here over on the YouTube feed here. We got uh, some of our regular folks in here, our, our uh, reigning fantasy champ, FM fans in here uh, popped in. Uh, our friends from the Alternative Football Network are here. Good to see y'all. Uh, do you guys see four? Uh, here's a question from Alternative Football Network. Do you guys see former XFL receiver Jeff Bidet? Uh, doing well with the Argos. I did see he signed there. I don't know much about him myself, but, uh, you know, Toronto is a team where I feel like they use a lot of different receivers, right? Like last yeah. year, like, like they, that, they have some stars. They've got like your Devaris Daniels and your DeMonte Coxie, and these guys are studs, but Chad Kelly spread the ball around a ton last year uh, amongst his receivers to the point where it was like a lot of solid guys, but I didn't, I don't know if I'd rank any of them, spoiler alert, uh, in my top 10 wide receivers from last season necessarily. Uh, so, yeah, I think there's room for, for anybody to come in and be competitive in that wide receiver core. The only question is who's going to be throwing them the ball because uh, things are still up in the air of uh, uh, based on the allegations uh, and the ongoing investigation with Chad Kelly. Uh, so, I think there's potential, uh, at least, uh, to get a depth spot for uh, someone here. Yeah, I'm looking at his, the quick stats. I uh, played seven games last year, 30 uh, catches for 405 yards and five touchdowns. I mean, that's not bad. I mean, in, you know, the football was not was still pretty good down there. Uh, he's played in the XFL or XFL, USFL, some time in the NFL. So, I mean, he's one of those guys where he's still – 
relative. We're talking about Stiegel went to 39. This guy's 29, so I guess if he in Stiegel years, he could still have another 10 years left if he if he, if he plays well. So I could see it, and I agree. I feel, I can't remember the exact stat, but I thought there was a few games too where like every receiver got a touch, or you know what I mean. There was like ten or like ten guys almost got a catch or a touch on that yeah. Argos offense, which which um yeah, which is unreal. And we talk about potential you know quarterback change. A new quarterback might toss the ball around even more. Then Chad, yeah. you know what I mean? They they have to find their guy, and you never know who that guy might be. If this guy, um, you know, is kind of sitting second reps, he might get a lot of time with uh, with the Dukes. Is that the back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He might get some time with Dukes, and then if Dukes gets the shot, this guy might have his opportunity, right? So, yeah, you never know. I wish I I, I honestly wish I had more hours in the day because I want to watch UFL. And I want to watch it all, but Saturdays and Sundays are tough enough as it is. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. I, I get you. Yeah. You already, I, got, you already got 10 sports going on. We both, you know, we got kids, we got wives, we got, you know, we just want to sleep. You just want to watch something, you know, and then, oh, there's more football on. Well, okay, cool. Yeah. I mean, I used to be huge into hockey. Now I oh. don't watch a single hockey game till the Lightning are in the playoffs. Pretty much, uh, I'll watch that, and I'll watch the Jets for the four games they play in the playoffs, uh, and that's it. Um, because there's just not enough time to consume all the sports no. going on these days. So, uh, yeah, I'm with you on that one. That I'd love to watch more if there was more time. Interesting note from the Argos website on Jeff Bidet. Uh He finished fifth in long jump at state championships. So uh, he's he's got horizontal. Is that the? It's not vertical. If it's long jump, I guess he's got horizontal. Yeah, but he's still got to jump high to get far. I guess to some degree. Yeah. Right? So. <laughs> I haven't done long jump or high jump or any of that since grade seven, uh, grade seven field day, man. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't even know if I could say I did, uh, to be honest. I can say I attempted, uh, but I don't know if the, my jumps would be considered long or uh, high. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm tall, but I ain't got the vertical. Uh, I'll say that. That that triple jump thing, that hop, skip, and jump or whatever, that, that was mine. That was my go-to. It was more of a shot put or discus. Well, shot put, yeah, shot put discus was good. Yeah, which also yeah. didn't work out well as somebody with no upper body strength. But you know, <laughs> track and field was not my strong point. I'll say that much. <laughs> That's why we have a podcast, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, just uh, you know, one thing that came to mind with this, though, I mean, former XFL players coming over to the to the CFL, we're seeing some of that too. The big talk when the XFL USFL spun up a couple of years ago was, oh, this is a threat to the CFL. We're going to lose so much talent. I yeah. feel like that didn't happen, right? Like, where when did the when did these leagues? I know they're merged together, but when did they first kick off? Was it 2020, 2021? Well, yeah, the XFL tried once, and then then they both shut down. Well, the XFL did, and then that was at AF, and they both shut down because of COVID. Right. So it would have been 2019 20, or 2020. And then the USFL and XFL came kind of again like late a year or two later. Yeah, I think it was 2022. Yeah. So, I mean, oh, see, I, I I don't know. I'm I'm in this holding pattern. The the a uh, Canadian patriot in me wants to say like F everything that's not CFL a little bit, you know what I mean? And, and no, the CFL is 110 years and you know, the XFL and USFL or whatever they call themselves can, can, they can succeed, but it's not going to hurt us. But then I'm like, well, you know what, especially since we've been a part of now of the AFN, their stuff pops up on our, on my Facebook page all the time. And I go, huh, maybe this is a little bit more than I thought. You know, it's maybe a little bit, but I don't know. With the with it going from sixteen teams to eight, that definitely helped the CFL. I don't think I feel like. See, I feel like the just the more leagues here is ben, more beneficial than it was it is. hurting, right? Like I think there yeah. was initial concern, especially when we started seeing guys last offseason like Darnell Sankey go off to the XFL. Yeah. You know, biggest like tackle leader in the CFL the going MVP. off there. Right, MBT just came off a great cup win, and but then guess what? They come back. You know, yeah, same, guys same come back, and, and I think there's a trade of talent. You know, some CFL guys will look at opportunities here, and some guys from 
Yeah. Uh, the spring leagues in the states and are going to look for opportunities in the CFLs. So I think it's mutually beneficial. Like, yeah. like to me, I, I, I the more football leagues, the better, uh, and it's going to make for better talent across the board to transition from league to league. See, normally I agree. In other sports like baseball, there's like a hundred leagues, right? We got the Gold Eye League, which is like the AA American Independent League, and then you got Double AA, A, Triple A, Single A, you know, all that stuff, major leagues. And all that. And I think some sports, yes, it's good. I just get worried about football because it's not as, um, because it's so physically taxing. You know what I mean? I, I get a little bit, a little bit more hesitant on it because like, again, baseball, it's, it's, you could go and play five years of single A before ever sniffing the big leagues. And then you could go, but because of football, your, your career kind of could end at what, 26, 27, Depending on the position, depending on injuries, you, you, these got some of these guys don't have time to like, they, you know, they they have to open up the horizons and want to play in some of these I'll call it smaller leagues than than the NFL maybe because you know in which we do see we see guys come up here and realize that there are guys, but I, I don't know, I just get a little I don't know I'm a little concerned about it, but and then just in general football and the rules like you know Richard Richard asked us a question about something we talked about last week a little bit the rule changes you know. We're seeing tackling changing. We're seeing different, you know, they're trying to implement kickoff rules in the NFL to add more jobs or to not lose jobs, you know. Because I was thinking about that. I was wondering, too, about that. Do you think if return games get a little bit more valuable in the NFL, do guys up, to, you know, some guys that sneak their way up in Canada, those return guys, do they maybe get jobs in America? Because yeah. of the kickoff. Because who, who really needs to do a kick return for 95% of the games? Right, you can put you can put your center out there, and he just has to go like this and let it bounce into the end zone. Well, yeah, right. CFL has a lot of like dedicated kick return guys, and I yeah. know well they they some of them play like regularly. But you look at Janarian Grant; he's depth receiver. Mario Alford's not uh, Terry Williams, like yeah. Javon Leak. These are guys not actively uh, uh, involved in their team's offenses, but are, are That's the, what the I mean. point that in the in the NFL you don't really need that because it's not that commonly at least up until now it's not yeah. that commonly been used so you can just have you know similarly like uh you can have anybody out there returning that's kicks not anyone it, but it, that's what makes me mad when you're playing Madden if you don't realize they'll put like the best suited player so your first string receiver might be your kick returner and you don't realize yeah. that and he gets rocked first play yeah there's, there's actual kick returns on Madden so it's when, like, are we, when are we bringing back the CFC? Pad? I don't know, yes. We got busy with that. It's okay, Richard. I think we we talked about the kickoff last week a little yeah, bit. We yeah, we did. Yeah, we said that it was in, okay. <laughs> we we don't want us getting changing it, but I think anything to bring it back to the American the NFL is good. Yeah, and anything that improves player safety, we were for that. Right. There, uh, uh, XFL Mike G uh, in the Facebook chat uh, sums up what I was trying to say in a much more eloquent, poetic way: of a rising tide lifts all ships. Uh, more players are getting more opportunities in more leagues, uh, and that's great to see. Especially, like you said, football careers are so short. Yeah, uh, it's great to see more of these guys. You know that put all of the effort in to train to try to get there uh, to find a spot to get to play professional football. So, you know, uh, if, if XFL Mike or alternative football, I'm actually, I was going to Google this. If they could just, what's the rough salary for a player this year? I, I'd be curious about that too. Because again, I think these leagues are good, but even the CFL where the top player, one guy's making half, a couple of guys are making half a million. Is that worth it? to just completely destroy your mental health and your body and stuff, you know? Well, yeah, that's, and, that's a whole argument. We yeah, can get into. you can make the argument is 50 million a year for Mahomes even worth it in the long run. Right. You know, I thought I saw something years ago that Sidney Crosby should have shut down hockey years ago, but he just had too much money tied up into it. Mm. So it's like, you know, and I'm just curious if, if the XF or sorry, UFL, I keep calling it the XFL UFL, we're gonna get booted from this network, man. If I don't, <laughs> if I don't smarten up here, but the UFL, I'm just curious. Fifty five a day, just showing. Okay, seventy k US American, so they make roughly what minimal Canadian Football League player. Makes. Yeah, I think that's. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, I don't know. I don't know the dollar conversion because I think minimal is around sixty five. I, I, I thought ours is in US dollars. Is it? Yeah, I thought so for for conversion to the American players. I thought it's all in America. Oh, interesting. So I could be wrong, but I thought it was five point three US. 
I've never, you know, every time contract details come out, I've never once thought about whether a CFL contract details reported are in Canadian or U.S. dollars. Yeah, this I thought know. has never crossed I my thought mind. It was, until this I thought it was U.S. and I thought because it was, uh, yeah, just easier conversion for the American players and because of their dollar being stronger generally. Interesting. But I could be, I could be way off. Like that could have been something I dreamt about, but. <laughs> Came to you in a dream or something. Yeah, it's 70k. Okay, I'll be a I'll be a backup kicker for 70k. So, oh yeah, heck yeah. <laughs> anyway, top ten or top fives? Let's go. Yeah, let's get into it. Uh, I saw some folks uh, throwing theirs out in the chat, which is fun to see there. So let's get into talking about our top five running backs. Uh, again, criteria similar to what we did with the quarterbacks last week. Go back and check out episode 244 if you want to see who our top five quarterbacks are. Uh, the criteria here is uh, top five running backs that we uh, are our picks for top five for the 2024 season. So uh, that might be different than what we think are as of today, the top five running backs, but you know, maybe they're in a better situation for uh, the upcoming season uh, based off of off-season movement that we think they're going to be a breakout player. That might put them into the top five, uh, but it's who we think is going to be our top five for 2024 that then we can look back on uh, halfway through the season, end of the season, and realize how terribly wrong we were. Um, Real quick, I was terribly wrong, FM fan. He Googled it. So CFL as are in Canadian dollars. So that's one ah, thing. There we go. Yeah. I googled, just, it too, I googled it too, and it read the exact same thing FM Fan had. So the old copy and paste button works good on his keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, buddy. I don't know where I saw that, but maybe I saw something that was showing what the conversion was or something, or I don't know, but whatever. Or maybe it's maybe I, maybe I got hockey mixed up because it's all in American dollars. Oh, yeah, that sounds more realistic because it's more American league, And the right? Jays and the Raptors and stuff are all in U.S. dollars. Maybe that's what I what I was getting mixed up. Well, quickly, before we do our top five for this yeah. year, you want to have some fun and look back at uh, our top five lists from last yeah, offseason here for even... running backs in the CFL. Uh, for myself, I had – or all four of us uh, had Kadeem Carey as number one on our list. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, he came off being the league's leading rusher the year before. Uh, that turned out to be a bit of a rough one. Uh-huh. Big injury for Carey this year and didn't do a whole ton when he came back after that. I had Jamal Morrow at number two. Uh, he finished sixth in the league in rushing yards, uh, but looks to be He's still unsigned now? Right, we He's talked still about unsigned. Yeah, he did not pass the physical with Calgary. Um, Brady Oliveira at number three. Kevin Brown at number four. James Butler at number five for myself. Uh you had A.J. Olette at number two. Uh, that turned out to be a pretty darn good pick there from yourself, uh, i got to say. I just, I'm the I'm the fountain that keeps giving, man. <laughs> James Butler at number three. Oliveira at four. Jamal Morrow at five for you last year. Uh, Adam, this was a fun one. <laughs> I'm really sad Adam couldn't be here tonight. <laughs> Glad I couldn't just grill him on what the heck he was thinking this day uh, when he put as his top five running backs, uh, Kadeem Carey, solid pick. Kevin Brown, I like that. Dedrick Mills, okay, showed some potential, uh, but uh, was also in a 1A, 1B with his number one running back. Uh, Frankie Hickson, the backup running back for the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, who hardly hit the field. Uh, and Greg McRae, the depth slot back for, uh, slash third string running back for the Bombers. Uh, Noah Brady Oliveira, though, on the that list. Was, there for that's his only way that he got Brady Oliveira off his list because we all know he doesn't really like the, like him. Yeah, so we'll find out where uh, where he goes on the list this year. Uh, last year, Mike sent in picks. This year, he didn't. <laughs> uh, but he had Kadeem Carey, William Stanback, Brady Oliveira, Diedrich Mills, and AJ Olet. So uh, you and Mike were the only ones to get Olet on the uh the list last year which turned out to be a great choice uh so let's start off with our uh, top five for this year i'll fill in the chart as we go along and then we'll review it afterwards uh do you want to start with your number five trip oh god this is the one i hated the most to do because running backs are so all over the place um but i went to 
The Montreal Alouettes. Oh, I'm not even going to go on their website. It's all in French. Jeshuan Atui. Um, I went with him. I felt like with how they, you know, he didn't have the stats. I don't – I had his stats up earlier. His stats weren't exactly maybe what I would have thought from him, but I thought I saw a lot of potential from him last year. And now this team's got one more year um, under their belt and everything, right? Another Another year – together oh where is this uh, I, I have his stats here if you want uh yeah. 229 rushing yards for him and uh one touchdown last year yeah he wasn't overly used but i think that they all kind of moved around now stand has gone too i think that kind of opens up some things uh he's the canadian canadian too right so that'll be interesting and like i said now Fajardo's gonna need another running back in there with william Stanback, uh in bc no. Yeah. Yeah. You see, man, I gotta, I gotta start um, studying up a little bit more. Yeah, fantasy drafts coming up, man, in uh, in a month and a half. Start studying. Uh, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> um, I like this pick though. I, I, I don't have Antwi. Uh, spoiler alert in my top five, uh, but I like the pick. Um, because with Stanback being gone, like, yeah, his totals weren't there last year because he was mostly in that backup role. It was either Stanback or Fletcher got the starting job. But now Stanback's out of the equation. Yes, Walter Fletcher is still there. But they also, as you mentioned before the show, signed Sean Thomas Erlington, another Canadian. So does that drive them more towards starting a Canadian running back and Antwi getting the bulk of the starts here and potentially more usage? In that sense, uh, I think it's still going to be running back by committee, but uh, I think he's going to have a solid year uh, this year. Uh, for me, for number five on the list, and it pained me to put this guy down to number five because I could see myself putting him higher as well. I'm a huge fan of his. It's James Butler of the Hamilton Tiger Cats for me. Uh, he did finish third in the league in rushing yards last year uh, with 1,116. He had seven touchdowns on the ground. He had a bunch of uh, usage through the air as well. Uh, I think I think James Butler is one of the best is one of the best running backs in the league, uh, and uh, he is the focal point of that Hamilton offense, especially with Bo Levi Mitchell at quarterback. And I think he's going to struggle. Uh, I think that they're going to have to lean on James Butler, uh, and he's the only running back, really, that they ever dress, so there's not competition there for him. Um, so I could potentially put him higher on the list, but I, I am really excited about the development we're going to see from some of these other running backs uh, that I'm going to slot him in at number five uh, for right now for me, uh, for James Butler. I think he's going to have another solid season again this year. And I think that having Scott Milanovic as his offensive coordinator for a full season and not Tommy Condell's garbage offense, uh, I think is going to help him uh, this year as well. So James Butler comes in at number five for me. Adam had Devontae Williams of the Ottawa Red Blacks as his number five. Let me go and uh, find his explanation. Uh, he said a full season will prove this guy amazing. So uh, he kind of took over the starting role uh, affirmatively and ran with it uh, late last year. Uh, that's who we've got at uh, at fives. Uh, let's go uh, to number four. I, I'll go up first uh, at number four here. Uh, and I'll piggyback off of Adam. I've got Devontae Williams at number four for me of the Ottawa Red Blacks. Huge fan of what he did late in the season last year. He had a 1,000 yards on the year while only playing 15 games. Uh, I thought the bulk of that came late in the season for him. And I'm expecting Ottawa's offense to be better this year. Their offensive line was rough last year. They made some good improvements there this offseason. Uh, I think they brought in some helpful receivers like Dominic Rimes. I mean, Drew Brown, if he, if he lives up to the hype, the passing game is going to be good. And I think that's just going to make the offense better there for Devontae Williams. Although now that I think about it, I think Tommy Condell's the offensive coordinator there, so maybe I should move Williams off my list based on that alone. But uh, I think I think Ottawa's offense is just going to be better, and Williams is going to be better as a result of that. Uh, that's my pick for number four. Who you got? I got the guy you talked about just prior, and James Butler. I I get. I agree. I was kind of surprised when I saw how many yards he had. I felt like he was – every week we were saying Hamilton needs to run the ball more, and he still finished third in the league right now. Granted, was it 
It was 400 yards down of the league leader, but he had one less game started. So, yeah, I just always felt like Hamilton was one of those teams that needed to run the ball more. And when you got a guy who's third in the league in rushing yards, and I, you know, I still think you should run the ball more. Maybe that average could get a little higher. We could blame that about some offensive scheme or some offensive line. Didn't have the big 20-yard-plus breaks like other guys did, but no, I think uh, – yeah, I think if if Bo wants to make it to I don't know Canada Day, you need to give it the ball to James Butler. Yes, I I agree. I agree. Uh, James Butler, uh, yeah, last year, interestingly, only a four point seven yard average. For yeah, him. He, got the, he actually got the ball a lot. Second most carries in the league behind Brady Oliveira uh, last year. But uh, yeah, but, you know, not because- as efficient. With, with the quarterback carousel, I guess they kind of needed to lean on him a bit, maybe too. So, but it was tough sledding for him a lot of times because there just wasn't the passing game to back it up. Yeah. Uh, there for James Butler, uh, we haven't given Adams number four yet, I don't think. Uh, and that's Kevin Brown of the Edmonton Elks. Uh, seriously, get an offensive line and let this man eat, says uh, the great Adam Stewart. Uh, there. At number four, we'll give his number three next just to finish off the train of chatter on James Butler because he is Butler up at number three. Uh, saying a lot of what we've said already, he's going to have to run like never before if the Thai Cats have much chance uh, was Adam's take on it. So uh, I think we're all in agreement that James Butler is one of the top five running backs in the CFL and is the focal point of, uh, a focal point of that Thai Cats offense there. Uh, who do you have at number three? I have someone you also talked about, Devontae Williams at number three. I, again, I agree. I liked what I saw near the end of the year. He ended with fifth in, you know, rushing yards, just got over the thousand mark. Uh, didn't, you know, I think again, with a new, new system, again, we don't know who the quarterback's hundred percent going to be yet. like, sure. It's likely could be Brown, but we might see a carousel. We might see Mazzoli who's hit and miss. We might see Brown who struggles now being a full-time guy and you're going to need to run, lean on your running back uh, at times. And uh, yeah. So Devonte Williams. All right. To round up the number three list here, I've got Kevin Brown of the Edmonton Elks. I am a massive Kevin Brown fan. I think I took him in round one or round two of our fantasy draft last off season. Uh, and I ended up, I think I traded him away to you in a trade for James Butler at some point during the year. Uh, Cause it was disappointing. That whole Elks offense was such a letdown, uh, especially that first half of the season before Trey Ford came in. Yeah. And yet, Kevin Brown finished second in the league with 1,141 yards on the season, had a 6.1-yard average, uh, which was top, I think, among basically all the starting running backs in the CFL. He was explosive when they gave him the ball. Uh, And I think the big thing that's going to take him to the next level is actually having McLeod Bethel-Thompson as the quarterback instead of Trey Ford because – uh, the passing game is going to be better, which is going to open up more opportunities for the rushing game. And he doesn't really have to worry about Trey Ford taking away as many of his carries. He's still going to take away the goal line ones. Like how many one yard plunges, two yard plunges is Trey Ford going to have? Probably quite a few. Uh, I imagine that uh, I wish would maybe go to Kevin Brown, but more of those opportunities, Bethel Thompson doesn't run. So if they want to get any running game going, yeah, you know, it, it's gonna go through Kevin Brown this year, and I think he's gonna have a monster year as a result. So that's who I've got yeah. at number three on the list. Uh, we'll go back to me for number two here next. I've got AJ Lett, uh of the Riders at number two. Uh, huge year for him. Props to you for putting him number two. I think on your list uh, coming into the year. A uh, thousand yard season for Olet, eight, eight touchdowns on the year for him. Not bad, given that he also had to contend with Andrew Harris in that backfield. Daniel Adababoye got some carries. Deontay McMahon got some carries in there. Uh, and Olet sat also for a couple of games at the end of the year because they were locked into first place already. So this guy is going to be everything Ryderville could possibly want from him as a marketable player. And I expect them to also use him quite a bit, given the offensive coordinator is a former uh, run game coordinator. 
uh, over there in Saskatchewan. So uh, bigger things to come for AJ Olet this year, I think. Uh, who do you have number two? I have Brady Oliveira at number two. I think the not to his not not because of him. I think the offensive line is going to struggle in Winnipeg, so I think that will hinder him, um, obviously a little bit. But um, I I yeah I I without ruining it, I think I kind of have a one A one B. It could very well be for my top two, but I did put Brady Oliver second because I just don't have. Any, I I've been saying it for a while that the Bombers O line is gonna let me down eventually, and they just it it gets worse and worse and worse every year. And the early to late two thousands are kind of PTSDs kicking in every time I see uh, Caleros take a snap, and he he's no spring chicken either. And I don't want him taking any hits. So uh, yeah, Brady Oliver will definitely get his chance. I think he'll still run for you know thousand plus yards, barring injury. I think he'll still. Likely be MOC, you know, um, conversations again, barring injury and uh, could he's, you know, all that stuff. But I just think the next guy will be a little bit better. Yeah, I, I think I have a feeling I know who's going to be number one on your list. Yeah, we'll you get never, to that in a second. Yeah, never, with, yeah. Actually, with you, I never know. It's very also. Uh, Adam agrees with me with AJ Olette at number two, saying he thinks he's going to be the linchpin this season. The riders need him to carry them to greatness, uh, which is a lot of what I had said earlier uh, <laughs> there as well on AJ Olette. Uh, let's go back to you right away for your number one here, then. Uh, go ahead and spoil it now. Oh, we got to give it to Thor. Got to give it to Thor, man. AJ Olette. I think that. You know, Adam is not completely sold on his team, but I am. I'm a lot more sold on the Rough Riders this year than a Rider, Rough Rider fan is, and that should say something, I guess, uh, because I think that they they seem to have a little bit of re rejuvenation now with their new coaching. You know, they got AJ Olette. They seem to uh, – they not pick up someone else. Who else did they pick up? Who is this? Sorry. The Rough Riders. Uh, well, they've got Frankie Hickson back at. Uh, Did they not pick up someone big overall? Or am I making that up? Okay, maybe not. Maybe I'm thinking of something else. But I, I, I definitely think, uh, yeah. And again, you never know with Harris's health. But if Harris doesn't get stay healthy again, you're going to need a guy like AJ Olette to pick up some, uh, pick it up with uh, what is it, Mason Fine uh, and a backfield there. So yeah, I think AJ Olette. And I think Labor Day Banjo Bowl. I don't, I don't want to see a pass football. You know what I mean? Like I think both teams could legit do old school college football, hand the ball off every play, and we'll still have a 35-33 game. It'll be like that the NFL game. Was it uh was it Mac Jones or was it Daniel Jones that threw like three passes and they won or something yeah. like that? Yeah, and and honestly, with with Oliveira and Olette, it'll still be an interesting, it won't be boring. You know what I mean? It won't be boring, I, and I. That's all. Oh, actually, they play three times this year, so that first meeting too. I, I, I'm the less that uh, Harris and Claris have to throw the ball in those games. I actually think the game will be more, maybe more exciting to some degree with those two. Yeah, Adam uh, to round out his list at Brady Oliveira at number one. That must have killed him. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll get to that. We, he said, we know he can go beast mode under a great offensive line. He can go full crazy in playoffs and great cup. Now, can he keep Calero standing up? So I think it's some of the similar offensive line concerns. But, yeah, he did put him over a let, which I thought went uh, against everything I know his character to be. So uh, I did question him on it, and I really like the answer he gave. Is he agreed 1A, 1B, and, uh, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, but one isn't learning a new system. One is. AJ might be better in the end, but it might take some time to get settled in Saskatchewan. For Olet. Is it a new system, though, if it's the same coaching staff he just had? Yeah, but, I mean, the coach is a defense. Well, I I guess mean, the head coach was the defensive that's coordinator. Fair. That's so. fair. Yeah, that's fair. Um, so, I don't know. Brady Oliveira at number one. I do as well. Uh, I... I think Brady's something special. Uh, like he led the league in rushing yards by almost 400 yards more than the next best in the league last year. And we're at, and had, what was it? One of the best Canadian running back seasons of all time. Uh, I think he was just a couple of hundred yards short of the record. Uh, and that also includes like 
early in the season, we were talking about him having a slow start to the year, I feel like, or there were a lot of games early in the season where for three quarters there was nothing, and then suddenly he'd run for 100 in the fourth. Uh, yeah. so. See, that's kind of my concern, too, because one, we just talked about A.J. Olette had three less games, and he probably got shut down a lot in the fourth quarter because of scores. I don't know if we're going to have that in Saskatchewan. I don't think Saskatchewan is going to be up 20. I don't That's think it's going to be 16 and two or whatever they Toronto was. And, but I'm also the other way, Winnipeg's that team that they keep the game close. And then next thing you know, they do nothing but run the ball in the fourth quarter. And I don't know if the offensive line can do that this year. So that's kind of where I'm at. But I, again, I could see both these guys being West, uh, very good co- co- for West uh, top running back in the West and even MOP in the West. Like I can see both these guys being up there at the end of the year, and again, we're probably gonna we can see the Rough Riders four times this year, and yep. in November these guys are gonna get nothing but the ball, right? So, yeah, I and I, I agree with you guys that it's a one A one B situation. It's hard it's hard comparing these guys because they're gonna have monster years. Yeah. I think the sky's the limit for Brady cool. Oliveira, and I. I I think, you know, I, I will say if he can stay healthy throughout his career, I think Olivera will be the Winnipeg-born running back we talk about uh, years down the road, more so than Andrew Harris. I think he's got the potential to I I, to I, I, I I see that. I don't think for talent. I think because Olivera started here. You know what I mean? I think that a little bit more. Because if Harris started here and he had those good years in BC here and built everything here, that's tough. Not to mention personality, right? I mean, the dude saves dogs f- between football games. Yeah. Oliveira does. So yeah, like, maybe maybe he'll stay up too late on game night and that'll mess some of his uh, stats up. Yeah, maybe, but like top 10 human yeah. in the CFL, right? Oh. Brady Oliveira as well. So uh, yeah, he's number one for me. I think sky's the limit. I think he could hit an even uh, bigger year yet than what he hit last season. Uh, and I hope he does because that would be fun to see. Uh, all right. These are, so that, uh, makes our top five list here. Uh, and let me, uh, pull it up on the screen for us to recap. And then we'll talk about the names that didn't make the list. Uh, top two for all three of us was Oliveira and Olette. Trey, you had Olette over Oliveira, but, uh, Adam and I had, uh, Brady on top. Uh, I had Kevin Brown at three, Devontae Williams at four, James Butler at five. You had Devontae Williams, James Butler, Jeshra and Antley. Uh, James Butler, Kevin Brown, Devontae Williams for Adam. So Adam and I both had uh, the same top five, just slightly different ordering in the bottom three there. Uh, you were the only one that put Antwi in the list. I think I gave my take on him before, uh, already. Uh, you did not have Kevin Brown on your list, which both of us did. Uh, any thoughts from you on Kevin Brown and Edmonton? I guess I was just sour after that trade, man. Cause I don't feel like, I, again, it was, I, I was a little shocked to see him that high up in the stats. I don't, he didn't give me those stats in fantasy time. I don't know where those numbers came. It must have been the stats correction at the end of the year for all those season or weeks they missed or something. Because I, yeah. I don't know, I didn't get those in fantasy, or maybe I got to talk to the person who controls the Excel sheet. I don't know. I, actually, if you want clarity, I think you did get those point totals in fantasy. You were just so far behind it. That's matter. That's fair. So maybe I didn't notice it. And again, I'm not sold on Edmonton. I I wonder. I wonder. Bethel Thompson's another year older. I'm not sold on that whole team as a whole. I'm not sold on Chris Jones. Um, and and I, I don't know. I, I, I think it's hard because I just I see Bethel Thompson, he pretty much won the Great Cup for Toronto. And then did he not lead the league in the XFL in passing yards? Or USFL, whichever league he went to? I think he did, yeah. yeah something like that. So he's clearly got top talent. But I just wonder, again, we're going to say about Olette having to learn a new playbook. So does M. Uh, Bethel Thompson, I don't know. Chris Jones is the defensive head coach more, so maybe that's why he gets the veteran guy because he doesn't want to mentor a young quarterback per se. But I'm not sold on Edmonton, and I, I uh, so it kind of makes me hard to be sold on their running back. I'm sure he'll end up being top five in some stats. He'll be the you know, he'll be the guy that I'm regretting not adding right now. But I think uh, yeah, I'm content. It, running back's tough. Any of these guys could twist an ankle in the shower today, and it doesn't matter. You know, yeah, yeah, it's true. Uh, Mike's favorite saying running backs are a dime a dozen, so. yeah, that too. Like, how many of these American running backs that have never even heard of what Winnipeg and Saskatchewan 
might end up being the league leader, right? So, yeah, for sure. Uh, let's go through the names that uh, we didn't, none of us had on our lists here. Uh, we'll start out on the West Coast with the BC Lions. Take one, Mazel, uh, William Stanback are their two running backs there. Uh, their top two, at least. I didn't have either of them on the list because BC's not a running team. They showed it last year. They threw the ball out. Mizell didn't have a bad year. He had 773 yards, but I feel like they were a pass, mostly a passing team and kind of showed that in the playoffs too, when the passing game got shut down and uh, they, they couldn't run the ball. Uh, And they brought Stan back in. I've been a big Stan back fan earlier in his career, but I just, feel like he's lost maybe a little bit of a step here and there at times. Uh, They're going to rotate in 1A, 1B between these guys most likely. I I don't think either of them was going to single-handedly have a top five performance. Uh, Were you kind of in the same boat? Oh, yeah. I couldn't decide which one was going to be the main guy. We're kind of, I don't know, four of my top five, I'm going to say, are guaranteed starters unless of injury. Right, you know what I mean. I don't think Ole or Oliveira are sharing time. Williams and Butler, not likely, and maybe Deshaun and we will. But you know, that, that's kind of where I was. Where I looked at those two guys, they're similar age, similar kind of stats. It's going to be one guy's a first down guy, one guy's going to be a second down guy. It's going to be situational, and and you might not know. It, it's 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 almost like NFL. I, you know, when there's four running backs and they could any guy could get you know, fantasy points. I'm actually surprised to see Stanback at 800 yards last year, given he missed a couple of games. He rotated. He had some other running backs in there. Uh, I'll give him credit. Maybe it hasn't quite lost as much of a step as I thought, but I still think it'll be a 1A, 1B type situation there. Uh, Calgary, Dedrick Mills is going to be the starting running back this year with Peyton Logan, the back up there. Uh, any, did, was there any consideration to Mills for you? I... I think our friend BBC Ryan should do the – or BBC Cat, not BBC, BB Cat Ryan or whatever. It should do the opposite of his fantasy and pick anything but Stampeders um, because I, I think that they, for maybe once in the last decade or two, might be last in the league. So I just kind of stuck away from them. Uh, Mills was actually the honorable mention for me. I mentioned before the show that I had a strong top six. I was trying to figure out, and Mills was that that number six that I could have put in here because uh, he finally he has the room to himself now. Uh, you know, for 802 yards last year, there were games late in the season where Carey came back, and it was like he'd split room. Carey would get the starts here and there. We were all talking about before last year. I mean, Diedrich Mills made two of our four top five lists, right? Somebody had him up at like number two or number three on their list. Uh, so uh, because he has shown explosiveness at times with Calgary. Now he's the go-to number one guy there. I think their offense is going to be better than last year with guys just getting healthy. They were riddled with injuries last season. Um, so I think Calgary's offense is going to be better, and I think Mills will be better as a result. But uh, I, I do have more question marks about them still than other teams, which is why he didn't quite make the top five list here for me. Uh, what other running backs do we have here to talk about? Uh, I don't think anybody had anyone from Toronto on their list. Uh, Adam did mention uh, Daniel Adebaboye as an honorable mention for him, the Canadian kid. Uh, I think he'll get into the rotation with Kadeem Carey uh, a little bit more because maybe Carey, you know, injury is uh, taking a toll on him and he, he's on a bit of a downward slide from that. Uh, I'm excited about the future of Adam Boy myself, uh, but I think there's going to be too much of a rotation there for Toronto for him to make the him to make my top five list. Uh, any thoughts on Toronto's running back situation for you? No, I kind of uh, agree. I think it'll just going to be kind of a rotation, and you don't know who it's going to be, and you might find the Olet replacement, but you also might have to go through four or five guys this year to, to do it. And I think that's pretty much all the running backs or the main starters that we have to talk about uh, here. So those are our lists. We've seen some people in the YouTube chat send in theirs as well. Uh uh, let us know uh, either in the comments or on social media uh, or in the Discord what your top five list is as well, uh, and let us know what we got wrong uh, or what we uh, we got right. Uh, there's not a lot of variation. I think we're all kind of on the same page 
for the most part here. Uh, far, like yeah. quarterbacks. I think, I think things are a lot clearer this year because last year I felt like we were all over the place, especially quarterback and a couple tough positions. But I think we've had another year, you know, to kind of think it over. And, yeah. I it's think wild it's- that it's more clear this year, though, when this was the big focus point of free agency in the – the legal tampering window was that like four or five top running backs were potentially changing places, right? So Yeah, but I think running backs, you still know what you're going to get to some degree. You know, like I get the scheme thing, but oh, let's just got to run forward. You know what I mean? That's the same in Toronto or Saskatchewan, right? It, it's it's not – I'm not trying to downplay his job. Like, yeah, he's got blocking assignments. Yeah, he's got roots. He's got stuff to do. But his, at the end of the day, his job is just to take the ball and get to the end zone. And I think that's – and I think he's going to enjoy running into the uh, Pils, uh, Pilsner zone there. So, <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Uh, excited to see how these running backs uh, play this year. And, yeah, another ta- – ta- a very tame top five uh, debate here, I feel like, between us. Uh, next week we're going to have to step it up a little bit, I think, Uh uh, we were talking about this a little bit before the show, Trey and I, and I think next week we're going to do uh, wide receivers and we're going to increase it to top 10 for a little bit more variation on that one because, uh, well, I think it's just going to be hard to narrow it down to a top five uh, wide receivers. So stay tuned for that. Look forward to that uh, coming uh asterisk next week because hopefully next week, unless scheduling mishaps, I won't. I'm not promising anything during the off season, but hopefully next week. Um, that's all our CFL related topics. You still want to get into some of the other ones we talked about, uh, Trey? The the non CFL topics, or do you want to just uh, wrap it up here? Uh, well, the FM fan, no, because if you watch the show, you know I'm hard on the bombers, so they're not going to be half bombers. I mean, there's a couple good bombers receivers, but we'll talk about that. Uh, I'm I'm good with whatever, man. If you want to wrap, we had a couple extra topics. If we just want to call it quits, I'm good, man. Your, I just wanted the first one I want to talk about is Stefan Diggs getting traded to the, yeah. the Houston Texans uh, in the NFL today for like a couple draft picks too. Only like low or low ones, I thought too. But yeah, I mean, I saw it coming. I don't think I don't think Diggs is the answer for for Buffalo. I think that. That salary probably could be used elsewhere. Um, yeah, the receiving core is pretty light right now to some degree, but and I think they'll need a new one guy. But they got us; they they still have some decent talent. I like their new tight end they had um, and stuff. So I'm not too concerned about Buffalo. I have see, I have a couple guys I I know and I trust, and the one is not concerned at all. You know, it's he's pretty content with this move and stuff, and so. I, I, if he is, if he's a lifelong Bills fan, and who am I to argue with him, right? So, yeah, Buffalo is Buffalo was a weird team last year, right? Like early in the season, they were just kept disappointing, and then they fired their offensive coordinator, and then after that, all of a sudden, they were uh, on a roll to end the season there. But uh, when they were on their roll at the end of the season, Stefan Diggs was not uh, for multiple years in a row. It's uh, once it hits like December, he's a non-factor in that offense. So I, I agree Buffalo probably is safe to move on from them. Uh, I'd like to see them maybe get a little more to that receiver core because they lost Gabe Davis. Uh, was their other big name there? Uh, a couple other names that don't come to the top of mind, but, um, but now, now Houston though, I think it's a good addition for Houston young quarterback who, well, did he won a playoff game last year, didn't he? And he almost was not too far from winning two. And now you get a guy like Stefan Diggs who has experience, is still talented. You know, I think CJ Stroud is definitely I think Houston's a team that I mean that and that AFC South isn't the greatest division in the world. So I could definitely see them now turning that into their division. I, who did was it? Was it RG three? Or somebody said Houston's the best team in Texas now. I can't remember who it was. It was RG3 or Stephen A or someone like that. But someone... They're fun. They're going to be a fun team to watch because oh, you got yeah. Stroud. Now you had Diggs in. They still got Nico Collins, Tank Dell. Uh, they added – I think they had Joe Mixon as well at running That's back. That's what I thought, right? yeah. That's what I was thinking of. I was trying to remember who they – yeah, Joe Mixon. Yeah. Yeah, so sacked offense there for the Texans. That's going to be fun to uh, – Fun to watch uh, this year. Uh, they turned it around big time last yeah. year, right? Like the year before, they were terrible. 
yeah. and then they rallied the playoffs. So we'll see what they do this year. Um, you watch any of the UFL this weekend? I didn't know what station it was on. So <laughs> I didn't check and uh, looked, checked over some of the scores. I mean, they were a little low, but I mean, I don't know. First week is always like that. New, newish. I'm going to consider it a new league, even though there are two existing leagues coming together. You're still feeling things out. Um, you know, how many of these guys are now in new systems? How many coaching staffs return? How many players are on different teams? So I, I'm not, and I don't even know how long their training camp really was, right? Uh, I guess I heard about the punter to center TD uh, and stuff, but I mean, yeah, that was it, wild. It, it is what it is. And uh, yeah, as you know, I, I mean, as long as our American friends are enjoying it, that's all that matters, I guess. Yeah, punter to center TV, it was like a TD was like a 50 yard bomb on a fake field goal, I think, or a fake punt. I guess oh, fake man. punt if it was the punter out there. Um, that was fun to see. Uh, also a 64-yard game-winning field goal uh, in one of the early games. Uh, crazy. That is uh, quite impressive. Uh, so you know what? Fun. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't get a chance to watch any of it either, uh, but uh, I love seeing highlights like this. Uh, big moments. You, you can't ask, especially if it's the first year of a combined league, you know, opening weekend, you want some of these exciting plays that are going to make waves on social media. Uh, mm-hmm. So I think that was a huge hit uh, to get those ones there. Why is there uh, a website? I don't get it. Problems with the website? Yeah, it's kind of weird. I figured out here. So yeah, the highest scoring, two teams scored 27. Not bad. That's decent. Uh, decent. The Birmingham Stallions and the San Antonio Brahmas will score 21. The lowest scoring teams were DC and Houston. So 12. So I mean, so I mean those those are scores that we see similarly in the CFL and NFL times to time. So it's not. I don't think it's too bad. And like I said, I keep. I haven't. I haven't seen any complaints from anybody um, that you know kind of talks about the league. Yeah, don't take this as official betting advice. Don't bet the farm, bet the ant farm. But I feel like early on, and I, I, I found some success with this with the XFL as well, uh, is bet the unders uh, for the most part early on until uh, teams build that chemistry here. Uh, I can see that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. I heard the average attendance was around 14,000 or something like that too. So, I mean, that's not too bad, I guess. Um when they're coming out, because before both of the leagues were doing like hubs, right? So this is the first time they're in their home stadiums to some degree. So I mean, that's yeah, it's so much better than the hub yeah. situation. Yeah. All right, let's get into wrapping things yeah, up here. Really. I think for today, uh, let me pull up the social media slide here. Uh, so again, uh, top ten wide receivers next time around. Look forward to that. Uh, in the meantime, follow us on social media. We're on Twitter or X at CF Countdown Pod. Uh, you can find me on there at Cooper Trooper 42. Mike is at Mike Garrell. Adam is at Adam Stewart One. Uh, Trey, what you all got going on these days, and where can people find it? You can find me at Trey Harness Link. It's uh, yeah, horse racing season's kicking off, got a lot of stuff to talk about. So, want to learn that. UFC, UFC 300 next week. I'll probably talk about that. Big one. Uh, what else? Uh, if you see me tweeting about the Jays, just leave me alone. I'm just, <laughs> just uh, yeah, just uh, trying to make it. Baseball's too long of a season, man. I, I, it's tough enough when a football team has a bad year at 18 games, but a baseball team, when they have a bad year at 122, oh, 162, yeah. I, I don't know how you, how you do that, but I mean, anyway. Yeah, see, I struggle. I, I even with hockey with eighty-two games. Like yeah. I know every game technically matters in the standings, but I struggle with especially not having enough time these days to like invest in watching uh, when it feels like every game is so inconsequential. Oh. When it's like one of eighty-two, and I couldn't even imagine with one hundred and sixty something. And then has. and baseball, they'll just throw these random games during the week at one in the afternoon. And you don't realize it until like the game's over. You know, and you're like, oh, I wanted to watch it tonight. You know, they do it like, uh, yeah, the Jays play the Yankees on Friday at noon. So it's like, you know, why? <laughs> yeah. But they do, I don't, I think it's something with their CBA and travel days since they play so much. I think certain travel days have to be noon games to, to allow oh, for yeah. or something. And then I know with baseball again, too, it's 
so many games, their attendance lacks, you know, who goes to a Tuesday game when they had a 10 game homestand or 12 game homestand. Right. So, right. You know, it's all good. It's, I'm sure they'll be fine. And my only, my only concern, I know we're wrapping up here, but my only concern is I hope that they're competitive enough that they don't decide to trade away their core. Mm. If that, if I do not want to go through a rebuild. That's not, I don't have the heart for that right now. Man, so you want them to take the Jets method and never trade oh. away the core because they're just competitive enough to get it in the first round. When I say core, there's two guys. It's Vladdy and Bichette. And outside of that, they could get rid of anybody. Except Owen Snyder. The new kid Snyder. What? I've heard those names yeah. before, so that yeah. sounds like a core to me. 100% Vladdy. Bichette, you could convince me because he's kind of crap but at times. But but, uh, but Vladdy, you got to keep Vladdy. But anyone else, I'm I'm I would be content with them, I guess, moving on to some degree. But man, like, uh, but I'm so happy they didn't get Otani because we didn't need a gambling scandal. So, anyway. yeah, yeah, that's all. Good point. All right, uh, find us on Facebook as well, Facebook.com/slash CF Countdown Pod. Check out Canadian Football Podcast Network at CF Pod Network on Twitter. Our friends at the Alternative Football Network who joined us here in the chat this evening at the official AFN on Twitter or alternativefootballnetwork.com. Again, uh, you know, we didn't uh, have a big UFL recap, but all the other great shows in the network, uh, I'm sure, are covering. Lots of them are covering different angles of the UFL. If you want specific teams or in general, uh, I'm sure you can find uh, the right show for you there. Uh, check out the Discord community as well to chat with us between episodes. Link in the episode description to do that. Uh, and uh, help support the show, whatever podcast platform you're joining us on. Uh, like, comment, subscribe, rate, review, share the show with your friends. Do all these fun little things that help us grow the show. We always appreciate that. And uh, on, uh, thanks to everybody who joined us live and the great comments in the chat as well. On behalf of Trey, I'm Ryan saying thank you for listening. Take care. Have a good one. Bye.